Your Partner in Success Radio is a free business podcast with host Denise Griffiths. It's all about great stories, conversation, and context to help you move your business and life forward with actionable tips and advice from her guest experts. To listen and subscribe, just find us on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you consume your podcasts. Good morning and welcome to your Partner in Success Radio. I am your host, Denise Griffiths, and this podcast is ranked in the top 2% of the most popular podcasts in the world. And honestly, it's all because of my incredible guests. I feel truly fortunate to spend time with people who are at the top of their game and they are passionate about helping you achieve your goals in both your personal and professional life. And my guests hold nothing back. They're here to share the secrets of peak performance with us And I know you'll find their insights both inspiring and actionable. So sit back, relax, and get ready to take your life and business to the next level. Oh, and take notes, lots and lots of notes. So my guest today is unicorn female tech founder, Tannis George. And she is a fascinating person. You should have heard our our pre-interview. She's a serial tech entrepreneur and a leading advisor on entrepreneurship and building successful co-founder partnerships. And she says that 65% of business partnerships fail because of issues between the partners. So over the course of her career in startups, spanning the last 20 years, she has co-founded, scaled, and successfully exited multiple data-driven businesses with the same partner. And her success has culminated with her most recent venture, Truly You, T-R-U-L-I-O-O, which she co-founded in 2011. Between 2011 and 2015, Tana served as Chief Operations Officer of Truly You, working to lay the groundwork and build the foundation for the trusted, innovative, and disruptive company it has become today. And in 2021, she reached Truly, well, Truly You reached unicorn status, which to me is just fascinating, solidifying both its place as the world's leading identity verification country, company. I can do this, and her track record for founding successful businesses. She is also the author of the Co-Founders Handbook and founder of the Co-Founders Hub, and we'll talk about that as well. Tannis, welcome to your partner in Success Radio. It's so good to have you here. I've been, I woke up this morning with, oh, good, oh, good, oh, good. I'm so excited to talk with you again. Hi, Denise. I'm excited, too. I'm very, I'm very excited about the angles we're going to go into today and all the pre-conversation, so I'm anticipating it as well. Well, listen, it's when you contacted me, I went, unicorn? What the heck? I didn't even know what it was. And, you know, I like to think that I understand most things techie. I did not know that. I went, oh. So once I started digging and we had our conversation, I was like, oh, I am so in love with this topic. So it is all about you. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, unicorn status, you're right. It is very much a – it's very much like a tech term. It typically means a company that has reached a valuation of over a billion dollars, basically, um, is what – and they call that a unicorn, although the last few years – Obviously, that that unicorn status has has become less. Um, how do you say it? It's been more become more common because we had such an incredible past few years. But uh, we're very excited to have been able to achieve that that milestone. What got you started down this road? I mean, do you, you didn't wake up at three years old and say, "Mommy, I want to be an astronaut when I grow up. I want to be a tech founder when I grow up." How did you get there? We, I really fell into it um, in many ways, but I grew up with a very entrepreneurial family. Definitely building and starting businesses was something that I grew up seeing um, modeled to me around um, around with my family, both my parents and my siblings. Uh, they all started businesses and, and they weren't actually academic at all. So I ended up really following their footsteps. And out of high school, I started my first company. I never went to college or university. And I think it really was just having a passion. I, have, I always have had lots of ideas and just really finding excitement and joy in taking that idea and turning it into something tangible. And that was obviously in me, it was bred in me. And 
And that's how, I would say that's how I got my foundation. But I met my, who would be someone who would become my long-term co-founder in high school. He, he and I, Stephen and I shared a, a locker beside each other for the five years we were in high school and we just became great friends and our relationship and our friendship uh, grew into a business partnership about a year or so after high school. So that's how it kind of got started. That was the beginning of the journey. It sounds like a novel. It really <laughs> does. You read about these things and, you know, every once in a while, I like to read. I, I'm a voracious reader. I read all the time. But every once in a while, my brain will need a break. And I'll pick up what I will call a cheesy novel. And it sounds, and I'm like, yeah, right. I'll be reading these stories. Go, wow, that's a good piece of fiction. Yours is not fiction. It's funny you say that. One of my favorite phrases in the world is the term, little did they know. To me, right. when I hear that, little do they know, I just get goosebumps because I'm so excited for the story that will unfold. And I think there's much of my life that kind of started off with a little did she know this blah, 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 blah. And I think uh, definitely little did I know as Stephen and I were forging a friendship and doing school projects together, little did we know we were actually building a foundation for our business, future business partnership for the next couple decades. And you, you're making a good point that you really need to pay attention to what you're doing, who you're talking with, who you're forging connections with, and don't just go, oh, hey, it was really nice to meet you, and then walk off. Yeah, pay attention exactly. to what the heck you're doing every day. You know, it's that typical cliche, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And I couldn't agree more with that comment. I think a lot of the successes that I've had has often really stemmed from a really great relationship with somebody. And I think that's a key piece and a key element, especially for young people. I, I say it to my two boys all the time, you know, make connections with people because that's where your real equity gets built up as you're younger. Absolutely. And these days we talk about connecting and networking, which are not necessarily the same things, but I think you need to do both. And if I had to choose, I think every single time. Absolutely. That's so true. It's so true. You build trust with a person best that way when you do that. And that trust is what pays dividends down the road. It really does. So I mentioned at the top of the show that you have said, and I think this is a direct quote from you, that 65% of business partnerships fail from because of issues between the partners. Again, it's that connection, isn't it? You either yeah. have it or you don't. It's so true. And that was something that really surprised me as I was uh, stepping out of the day-to-day -day at Trulio. I really was looking, what is it that I'm going to do next? And I considered what is something that I'm really passionate about. And I advise a lot of uh, founders and different topics in entrepreneurship, but the most common one was people coming to me and asking, how have you built multiple businesses with the same person and you haven't killed each other yet? <laughs> you know, ultimately that was a question. And I reflected on that and it, you know, it was something I had never really thought of, but as I started to reach out to other founders to find out why, why their partnership succeeded or failed, I often found that they were silently suffering. That was the term that I, I coined. And the reason for that is that when you're in a business partnership, if something's going wrong, it's very hard to talk to people about it. You know, you have to be very careful who you, who you share that information with. You can't necessarily talk to your employees because that would sort of break confidence in you as, as leaders of the, of, of the company. You can't talk to fund, uh, you know, your investors. You can't talk to suppliers or even friends because they don't have that same. And your family is totally biased. They're always going to take your side. And sometimes that's not healthy. So um, I think that is where the beginning of struggles happens with co-founders is they, they come across issues and they really just sort of hunker down and either try and work it out on their own or they sweep it under the rug thinking that that's going to go away. And unfortunately, as the statistic says, 65% of those partnerships fail because of issues between the founders. And it's really unfortunate. And that's what I'm here to help stop from happening. It sounds like bad marriages. I mean, mm -hmm. you just quit talking. You just go your own separate directions and you hope it works out. Of course, it's not. If, you, if you're not 
speaking. By the way, am I mispronouncing Trulio? Truly, correct it's me here. Tru- what a, yeah, it's Trulio. It's truly, truly you. Truly you. Okay. So I de- uh, uh, truly you was it is an identity verification company. So truly you was the um, you know just the, the the fun phrase we added uh, for the company as it uh, addressed the idea of being able to verify people's identity. Gotcha. I wrote it down and then went, did I hear her wrong? I do that. You know, I'll be scribbling things and moving a cat's butt off of my notepad and go, I don't think that makes sense. So anyway, there you have it. It is what it is. So let's, you, let's go back to the communication and I wrote down silently suffering that grab my heart we've Mm. all done that at some level in our life in our business and we're going to continue to do it i'm afraid but what is it that you really want people to know how do they have conversations when do they have them because i mean if the partnership is going to fail because they're not really communicating that can be avoided can't it Absolutely. So the first thing that I talk to uh, entrepreneurs about as they're starting to build a a partnership is obviously first and foremost is choose your co-founder correctly the first time, (laughs) like before you even get into a partnership, do as much due diligence as possible as you can in the early stages before you even sign that contract. So that's the first step. And to find the right co-founder, what I suggest that people do is a very, very thorough self-examination. And it sounds, again, cliche and kind of cheesy, but really to be able to know who that person needs to be to kind of fill those gaps in your own business acumen, then you really need to know yourself. So asking questions, what is my personality type? What is my conflict style? How do I handle um, my learning? Like what is my learning style? Asking a lot of these questions really helps you to see where you might fall short. Then on top of that, there's other really, really important questions to ask. And that is questions like, what are my goals with this business? I'm gonna give you a real quick, quick example. I spoke with two co-founders who were in the midst of building an ice cream company and they were in the very early stages. And interestingly, she, I I talked to her one day and I said, how's the business going? And she's like, Oh, we closed it. And I'm like, really, you guys have put many months into this. And she said, yeah, one day we were talking and I was telling her about how I think we could get our ice cream into whole foods. And she looked at me and said, Oh, I just, want to do farmer's markets (laughs) and she said we realized is that she one partner really wanted a weekend fun hobby and the other one wanted to go big and they realized that they weren't going to make it work now fortunately they realized that before they had any major investment but that's an example of sometimes people don't consider what the full-time goals are of the founders and then they jump into a business and they're not aligned so that's one, that's the first stage. I, I call it the early stage before you even sign the partnership. That's, that's the first test of whether or not a partnership can succeed. And they couldn't work it out? They, they, they recognized that it was too big of a rift between uh-huh. them, that it wasn't, neither of them wanted to budge. So it just made sense. to to call it quits. And so interestingly, we created at the co-founders hub an exercise called the self-assessment. And this really walks people through all these questions that people can ask themselves and fill in. And then at the end of it, what you end up seeing is a real bird's eye view of what is important to you and where you need to fill in gaps. Or once you take a look at your business, Sometimes you want people to have the same skills as you or the same methodology or execution plan that you consider. And that might be because you you don't want someone who's highly, highly detail oriented when you're building a business that you want to flip in 12 months. You know, you want someone who's in it to just get it done and pivot and turn and be malleable as the business needs in the early stages. So in that case, you don't want someone who's going to drag their feet. So this is really an important exercise. For people as they're starting their partnership and you just answered some questions I wrote down so um, one was conflict style sometimes I think I know what mine is sometimes I don't other times I'm just going to be cranky you never know but you have to pick a, you have to pick a lane 
So where can people find that assessment? I think that's a very good starting point for many of our our listeners here. Yeah, so the Co-Founders Hub is a platform that we've built, and it's designed to help people in all stages of their partnership. So we have products on there. They are just about to launch. Actually, it's perfect timing. They're going to be launching towards the end of this month. And um, these resources and tools are going to be made available for founders <clears throat> to, con- to take on as they build their businesses. So at the cofoundershub.com. Thank you. And I'm going to get you to repeat that at the end of the show so people don't forget or didn't hear it or joined us late. So one of the things that you talk about, which I think is so critical, is that intentionality is the key to success. Mm-hmm. You can't just wake up one day and go, oh, like I did. I'm going to be a web developer when I grow up, (laughs) which I am. (laughs) That didn't work out well. I had to get very – I mean, my business grew, but it grew in ways that I didn't intend. Hmm. And I had to all of a sudden get my – I was the bottleneck, no question about it. I had no intentionality. I was just going to do what I wanted to do, largely because I'm an introvert. I don't play well with others. Mm-hmm. I run with scissors, and if you want coffee, you can get it your own damn self. I'm not going to work in your office. So I had to build my own business. But this was 20 years ago, and there was nobody that could teach me a darn thing. I mean, we were barely had the Internet at that time. Yeah, so you lead into the what I would consider the second stage of a partnership, and that is once you're in it, you need to really communicate expectations. And I find this is where a lot of partnerships start to fall apart. And that is where they say terms like, I thought he was going to, or I thought, I figured he was going to oh. take that on, right? So and nobody so is, knew. Yeah, like a marriage. I thought we were going to have kids. No, we're not. <laughs> oh, geez. Exactly. Exactly. So that's the uncommunicated expectations that people tend to overlook. And I understand that because when you're in the early stages of a business, the last thing you want to do is be a wet blanket and start asking these hard questions and be like, well, what's going to happen if, you know, you aren't putting in the work time, you know, putting in the hours that we discussed that we were going to work? Or what happens if, you know, we catch you stealing or what, or, or whatever it ends up being. And, and so a lot of times people don't ask those hard questions and, and how do you protect yourself and handle situations that will arise in your business. And so what we did with that one is we created an, another exercise, which we call discovery session. And we put together about 120 extremely important conversations that you need to have with your co-founder to mitigate conflict down the road. So I'll give you a couple of examples of those. One of them would be, are we going to allow our kids to work in the business? Now, this is a perfect example of when you want to answer that question before your co-founder tells you that they're you know, 17-year-old son should probably be the manager of your business, <laughs> you know. Oh, when you, no. You no, know, no, no. Like, and, those, and those things happen all the time. So I always say that's an important question to discuss so that you're not dealing with that in the moment where you have to say, actually, I don't want your son working as a manager. In this way, you can just have a very generalized response and that emotion isn't there. So these are these uncommunicated expectations. One thinks, oh, I presume my kids are going to be in the business and possibly even take it over. And the other one's presuming, oh, no, we're going to sell this business in five years. So these are the questions you need to ask as well. And, of course, the simple ones like when are we going to draw a salary? How are we going to put equity into this business? Who's investing? Who's going to handle you know, cleaning the office, like you said? And who's going to be that front-facing person? Uh, when it comes to media, let's say, and if that's the type of business you're in. So there are a ton of questions. And if you can answer those before they become an actual question in your business, you are so much further ahead. Well, and that makes sense. And, you know, some of the things that, that you just mentioned, well, yeah, that makes sense. And others, I'm thinking, I wouldn't have even thought of that. And I know mm. I'm not alone in that. Most people don't think of these things. They're caught in the you know, the first blush of romance, oh, we can do this, this is so exciting, off we go. And then they hit that brick wall, like, I don't even know you, what the heck happened? 
Exactly. And so that's where, like you said in earlier on, that's where intentionality becomes important. And this is actually the real message that I'm trying to tell to people, because I find as I talk and as I spoke to hundreds of co-founders in different various stages of their business or after, after a success or a failure, what I found is that oftentimes people focus on the business. They focus on getting revenue or fundraising or building a great product. And what they do is they set it and forget it, their partnership. And that person beside them, they totally take them for granted. And what they don't realize is that person is either your greatest asset or your biggest liability in your business. And intentionality is so important daily, weekly, monthly, and annually. Those are the four things that I I recommend people very much take the time to build in and keep strong that partnership as it goes through. Give us some examples when you're saying daily. What should you be checking in on a daily basis? Yeah, so the first one, and, and, and as, you, the, the, as you extend the frequency, then the more in-depth it comes. So the first one might be just an email in the morning or at the end of the day saying, hey, just a heads up, here's what I did today. Um, here's what I'm working on tomorrow. Uh, if, if, you know, I have this question for you. It's just a touch base. It's something that, and, and, and it allows your partner to see what you've done, um, to see what you're working on. It allows you to stay together in the same purpose. Because at that point, your partner might say, hey, I actually need you to do this tomorrow. And then you're not surprised when it happens. So daily is just a quick check-in and then, you know, go about your day. But then weekly, it might be, you know, every, once a week, we're going to sit down for an hour, maybe have lunch together, and we'll have another more in-depth set. Here's what, here, uh, here's what I worked on this week. Here's where I see some challenges in our business coming up. Here's what I'm excited about. And just a quick conversation. But every single week, be intentional to talk about your partnership. Hey, you know, I noticed you said this. Um, at the at the meeting at the team meeting, what did you mean by that? Because I feel like I didn't understand, and I just want to clarify. So that's what that weekly lunch, and then monthly might be a little bit more in depth, where you sit in front of a whiteboard and you draw out your business and you see is there any issues that we've got here with maybe our organization chart? Do we need to be doing something um, a little more tangible here? It's all about making sure that you and your co-founder are always heading to, in the right direction together. And that's what this communication does. It, it takes away these opportunities for uh, a misunderstanding or a miscommunication, and it allows you to always be very upfront. And then lastly, I would say once a year, go away for a weekend. Go do something fun. Whatever you guys are both into, go out there, do something fun, and really plan your year ahead. Go through each employee in your business. Talk about what the goals are. And again, this is where you get deep in and ask the hard questions. Like, are we, are we still passionate about this business? Are you still into this? I, you know, I am or I'm not or I'm afraid of this. And you have these real intense conversations. And so we've got a product for that. It's called Discovery Session. And that, that goes into a lot of those questions as well. And I wanted to ask you, I'm assuming – that's always a bad word because I always <laughs> fall, fall straight into a puddle. <laughs> but I'm assuming that not all business partners are local, that they may live in different countries from one another or different states. So they have to find ways to make the you know, daily, weekly, everything that you're talking about happen. Oh, absolutely. Especially in tech, that seems to become more and more uh, of a common occurrence where you have founders who are maybe one is out building business somewhere else, or they're just not always in the office together, especially now post-COVID. There's a lot of people trying to find a way to work from home or work from somewhere uh, topical (laughs) or something. It depends on the kind of business that you have. So in those instances, it's even more essential that people are having conversations and discussing these really, really important topics. I, 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 I put a symbolism like this. Imagine that these uh, founders of these businesses are captains of a ship, and they're both holding on to that steering wheel of that ship, and they have an idea of where they want to go. Now imagine if one founder in the back of his mind wants to go to Portugal, and the other founder wants to go down to Africa. <laughs> you know, How is that steering wheel going to 
happen? How is it, how is that steering of that ship going to happen? One's going to be pulling a little bit this way. One's going to be pulling that way. And the more of that happening, the more likelihood of conflict. So the more that you can communicate, the more likely that you will be both going towards the same direction and you're going to have less friction. So that's why communication and intentionality is so important. It really sounds like co-founders need to be in their own kind of um, psychological meetings, maybe. Yeah. Does that sound about right? I mean, you <laughs> have to really, you know, get rid of those, un well, avoid unmet expectations and figure out what your conflict style is and be in touch and be connected and figure it out before it becomes a real problem. Well, I always say that what people need to understand is the business partnership is one of the most unique relationships a human being will have in their life. And the reason for that is, un or similar to, say, a spouse and, and, your, and your close family, that person is going to be so involved in your life that they will affect your professional life, but also your private life, your spiritual life, your emotional life. And you need to understand that the things that they do will affect how the course of your life goes and vice versa. The things you do really is going to have an impact on their life. And so you really do need to come together. You cannot take that relationship for granted. It's extremely important that you work on it, just like you would in a marriage. But what you really need to do is be intentional and work together so that, and remember, you are a team. You both want success. So it's very unlikely in very rare occasions is someone actually twisting their mustache going, <laughs> I'm going to get <laughs> screw over my <laughs> co-founder. It's very seldom the case. Really, everybody wants success. So being intentional and communicating is so important so that you are on the same page. And that makes perfect sense. Um, do you have any case studies? I mean, it really does because when we're connected to somebody, we're connected if we're doing it properly, if we're paying attention. And what impacts them can certainly impact you at every level. So you have to be careful who you bring into your life and into your business, no question about it. So do you have any case studies where you've had to help people through marriage counseling, so to speak, and say, okay, everybody take a corner, let's work this out? Absolutely. And I think that was really what hit, got me interested in taking the time to write the book, uh, the co-founder's handbook, because as I talked to these co-founders, had, I've had multiple co-founders tell me that they're not even talking to their business partner at that moment, that they're Ouch. talking to each other through their office manager or they're only speaking through email. And imagine, even if they think that they're managing it. Imagine what's going on with that business. It's not getting the focus that it needs from the people who are making the key decisions. So as much as you might think that you can get away with not having a great relationship with your partner, it's not true. I see it all the time. Once it starts to spiral, if they say, oh, we're going to end the partnership, I would say in my experience, at for sure half the time, the business ends up going along with it. And, and that's unfortunate. And that was, <clears throat> excuse me, why I really wanted to help entrepreneurs because I'm such, I have such a passion for entrepreneurship and, and, and free enterprise and, and, and the ability for people to innovate and start businesses. And this is such a key piece to it that when partnerships are failing, we really are risking the business itself. And, and that's not uh, anything that, that benefits us even as a society at large. So it's really important that we help these entrepreneurs build strong partnerships. Well, it sounds like when they quit speaking together and they quit meeting and they quit connecting at a cellular level, that they're just layering bad feelings on top of anger and all kinds of garbage and they're just layering that and that takes over after a while, I would guess. Yeah, and one of the things that I explain to people, too, is I think we always think that we, we, we often parallel co-founder partnerships to a marriage, and in many ways there are parallels. However, what I've discovered in my experience is that if the co-founders can, I quote, you know, would, would 
quote, I guess, would they would marry, <clears throat> excuse me, marry the business. Oh. And that is their focus. And then they are like, say, like co-married <laughs> to it. And their job is just to work together. But if they can focus and say that the business is the priority and run decisions through that, oftentimes you can take away the emotional side of decisions and, and, and go from there. So if we take, for example, that idea where one co-founder says to the other, I want to bring my son in to this business. If the uh, philosophy behind how they execute their business model, if the philosophy is, well, what is the best for the business? Not that I want to make you happy and I want you to have the best experience. The question is, what is best for the business? Then you can factually go, well, is your son actually the best person for this role in the business? And what could be some of the pros and cons of having him join? And hopefully, if the founders are mature, at the end, that list will either be like, yeah, actually, his son is a great person to be in the business, or actually, you know what, you're right, maybe my son is not the best one. And so that is one way to go into a business partnership with that lens. And that can take away a bit of that emotional um, issues that can arise. And using the example of the 17-year-old son, I admit I did a whole body free son. I just shuddered when you said that. <laughs> um, where, I seriously did. Where does the kid start? Does he start in the warehouse? Is he the male boy? You know, where does he start? What does he learn before he ostensibly takes over? What is he going to bring to the table once his training is, you know, out there and he knows what the heck he's doing? There's so many questions there. And Denise, too, the other thing that I often tell people is in the early stages of your partnership, identify an advisor. Now, this is somebody oh. who will come alongside you as you build your business. You keep them updated with how your business is going, preferably someone who doesn't have in, uh, vested interests but who can come alongside you. So for these kind of questions where you go, oh, you know what? This is like kind of a charged question. I, I, it, it, it has a lot behind it. Maybe this is something we should run by blank and have them give us their input of whether or not they think and allow that person to be that, that a, a added voice that can come in and advise. And that's something you set up early on or as soon as you can and say, listen, will you be there to help us as, as, a, as a sounding board as we build our business and as we build into our partnership? And ultimately, too, if worst case scenario, you don't have that, but you need that help now, that's what mediators are for. They're great people that you can go to just to handle a single issue or to help unravel a big mess that you've built in your partnership. So how do you find an advisor? Are we talking about mentors or coaches or what's any of where that. do you go? Where do you start? Yeah, you know, I, I love mentorship. I think men, I've had a mentor since I was, oh gosh, 17 years old. And I've used that person for everything uh, that I have ever <laughs> needed excess uh, assistance in. But if you can identify a mentor, if you can find somebody who maybe a bit understands your uh, industry, who who you appreciate, how they how they tackle issues, and just reach out to them and say, hey, I know this isn't typical, but this is what we're looking for, and I respect you as a person, respect you as a business person, or I expect your intuition and how you handle conflict, and we would love for you to just be that sounding board that you know comes in every three months. Or something and we can run through some questions but there are also coaches out there who who do help people in partnerships and of course there are actual companies or or professionals who handle mediation now when you're bringing somebody like an advisor and do you pay them or are they how does that work yeah, so I I think everybody should be paid for what they do. Me too. And I, I think it's really important. So yeah, if you know, in in the case of say a mentor, um, you maybe again it depends on your business. Maybe you say, hey, I'd love to have you come in, and and, and these are some perks that that I would do. When we built our business, advisors in our company they got equity actually in our business, and 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 sometimes that's between like a half percent or a two percent. That's a much more depth advisory role, but that is something you could also do. Again, it totally depends on your business. But if you think about it, 
how much money are you investing in building your business? And anything that you can do to strengthen that partnership is like an insurance policy. So if you've got on the line 100000 maybe you make millions of dollars a year in your business, then investing some money and in, in paying somebody as like a, a sounding board or investing in products or investing in time with your partner you know, on a trip or something, that is such a small percentage that will help you protect your investment in your business. So you've got to start to see things as what am I risking here? I am risking failing in a business. I am risking losing this investment or this uh, cash stream that I have that I've been building. So you have to invest in that. Again, remember, 70 or 65% of partnerships will fail because of issues between the partners. So invest in that partnership. That's an insane number. I mean, it really mm-hmm. is. And you just said something really important. Uh, I would like to kind of go over, th- there's a mindset, I think, between cost and investment. Let's touch on mm-hmm. that a bit. Yeah, absolutely. And again, what I think needs to happen is you need to start to look at your business when, in terms of your partnership as something that you and another person or you and two, three other people are all in it together. And so it's really, really important to think, how can we strengthen this component of our business? And it's an investment because it will pay dividends. Obviously, it will protect you. It will, it will strengthen your ability to build your business. And so it's not really a cost. It doesn't just go out there and get, it get lost. It will give you a return. And that is strengthening that foundation of your own business. And so it's, it, it's, definitely, it's definitely not something to be taken frivolously and to try and be cheap on, that's for sure. And that's what I was trying to get at because, I mean, there are going to be number, numbers people working in the business or they're mm-hmm. advising you, maybe they're your CPA or your investment banker. There are going to be people saying, okay, this is a cost, but you need to determine, I think, as the, the principles – is this a cost that we can afford or is this investment that we cannot bypass? Well, you could even say, what would it cost for me and my co-founder right now to uh, separate our partnership and have one of us leave? And what are the legal costs mm-hmm. of doing that? How are we going to break this business apart? How is that? How, who's going to take over from here? How, what is the buyout for that other partner? How much is that going to cost me? And you start to run those numbers and you go, oh, gee, this is not an inexpensive proposition. This is something that, and, and this is at that moment where you see just how destructive breaking a partnership up in the middle of a business can be. And that's why you will be incentivized to do everything that you can to keep that partnership strong. And see, I think that is so strong. And, you know, when people are building their businesses or going back to the 17 year old, God bless him, whoever he is. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, so many people, and I've seen this time and time again, say, well, I'm married, you know, my wife needs to inherit the business. Oh boy. Yeah. So partnership insurance is not your only thing to worry about. No, no. And, and, and the whole idea of bringing family into business, I mean, that's its whole other side of things. Actually, one of the first stories in, uh, in, in the book is about um, how a, a partnership really was destroyed because what happened was one of the co-founders did bring his wife in and the two of them slowly, slowly started to sort of take over control and not, they would go home and discuss the business and make their decisions. And then they'd come back and that third wheel, quote unquote, was left going, oh, wow, you know, you guys are making these decisions without me. And it's, I, I've seen it seriously, Denise, time and time again, it's such an important one. And, and, and so it's really unfortunate, but it definitely does happen. And nobody expects it. You know, no one goes in anticipating anything to go wrong. So you never know what's around the corner. And this is why I'm such a proponent of being prepared, having these little conversations and setting a standard for how some of these um, situations will be handled when and if they come up. Sometimes if you talk about it enough, you're not even going to have to deal with the situation because 
everybody will know what the consequences are if something happens in that direction. So again, communication is so, so important and intentionality can't, you cannot just leave it to the fates. No, you can't. And I've seen, I haven't seen anywhere near what you've seen, but I've seen small businesses or small partnerships just, ah, oh, I want a divorce. What? Mm-hmm. What, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> so, and you're Absolutely. right. I mean, it's, it's personal, it's family, it impacts everything you're doing. So I'm, I think my next question, Tannis, is, okay, you've done it, you've started it, you're still in that honeymoon phase, you're still very excited, but it's never too late to go back and start really building out, you know, through those discovery sessions or whatever it is that you advise, but answer those questions and get those sorted out before you really hit that, uh, I'm talking to my attorney, we're done. Yeah, it's literally never too late to start That's working what I on thought. your partnership. Yeah, absolutely. And we have a, a really cool thing at the Co-Founders Hub called the 90 Days Challenge. And this challenge is we, we provide twice a week uh, an email that, that gives you intention thoughts, so things that you can think about with your partnership, and a small little action item. For example, one of them would be, Say something to your co-founder today that you appreciate that they do well. You know, in entrepreneurship, as you're building a company, it is a roller coaster. It is, it, it, it throws every situation at you and it creates every emotion. And you are high and then you're low and then you're struggling and you're always doubting. I mean, it's such an emotion filled. What's so great about that co-founder is that person can be there beside you to cheer you on when it's hard and also be there to help you be, um, you know, through making those decisions that might be difficult. And so say something to your partner that is genuine and is a real reflection of the work that they've been doing and say, you know, I really appreciate um, what it is that you've been doing with our team. I see that you're building a bond and and I really appreciate that you do that really well. Good job. Like, how great is that in building that excitement and putting that energy back into people when sometimes on a daily basis as a business owner, you're just exhausted. Here's somebody who can really uplift you because they know exactly what it is that you're contributing. So something like that would be like, just today, say something to your partner. Say, good job. You do this really, really well. (laughs) You know, that's just one example of something that you could do to really build that partnership up. Sometimes you have to have that discussion with yourself as well. Oh, 100%. we tend to forget what we did that was just so amazing to anybody else but us. And we're like, uh, okay, thanks. Exactly. We just, we just brush it off. Yeah, it's so true. And that's why when people ask me all the time, should I get a co founder? It sounds like it's actually going to be a nightmare every time. But I often say, no, it can be one of the most incredible relationships you will have in your life. And, and as you decide to be an entrepreneur and you decide to build a business, if you can have that person beside you and you can have fun with them and you can, and you can break through these challenges together, you create a friendship and a bond that you will not find anywhere else. And if you have that advantage, again, when I talk to business partners who've had success as a business partner, they say, I appreciate this person so much in my life. They have enriched me. I am better because of them. I am so grateful for it. And it really is one of the greatest relationships you can have. And I would never want anyone to miss out on that opportunity. And that's why I'm building into it because I know it can be amazing. I have an incredible friendship with my co-founder and he and I, we sit down sometimes people don't understand what we're talking. We have almost like an inner language between the two of us because we've had so many experiences and we can laugh together. We can cry together. We can talk about everything that we've done and what, a gift he has been in my life and I, I hear that all the time and it's possible so if we can if I can help people get there to me that is one of the greatest gifts that I could give I love that let's talk very quickly about your your co-founding partner and your experience because you co-founded your first startup and I think it's I query is that correct yeah. 
That's in, right. In 19, okay. In, good, good, Denise. In 1999, <laughs> and that yeah. company was one of the first to make consumer credit reports available online. And then yeah. it was then acquired by Experian in two, I never know how to say that one either, 2003. Yeah. And then in 2004, you co-founded NCB Data Services, which again was acquired by Experian in 2006. And then in 2005, you co-founded identity management firm Theros. Is mm-hmm. that right? Theros yeah. Global Strategy, yeah. which yeah. was acquired four years later. And I'm guessing that all of these were done with your partner. They were. Yes, we were. We built each and all four of our companies that we built, we built together. And, you know, it's interesting because uh, our, our, our last company together, Trulio, what we found uh, if it came to challenges in that business, it was for the first time I, I started a family and what I call life stage did play a factor in our partnership that it didn't before. And it threw us some curveballs. And so one of the questions that we often ask people is what life stage are the partners in? Because that can really affect it. Steven um, was still, um, didn't have a family, and I did. And for the first time, I had to really balance and try and, and, and work with a home life with two children under the age of two <laughs> when we started Trulio, uh, two kids under two, and then at the same time be building a huge tech startup. And so that created its own set of issues, which we never had to deal with before. So just because you're able to always work with the same person, it's still important to really assess what it is that you bring to the table, both with your um, assets and your skill set, but is there anything else that's changed that could affect it? And so we had to navigate that space. Uh, with me being now a mother uh, with two small kids, I, I couldn't just jump on a plane and head over to Australia and work on a project there. I had It had to be a little bit different, which maybe meant that he had to take that role on um, and it had to shift our responsibilities a little bit. And so, again, these are the things that you have to consider when building a partnership. It isn't just about, hey, what, what, what are you able to do? Um, there are other factors that will play into the strength of your partnership. I'm so glad you brought up life stages. Honestly, I hadn't even thought about it. It wasn't on my list of things to go, you know, ask you about. What Do you mind sharing some of the problems or issues that you said, oops, we need to fix this? Yeah, well, again, it, it came down for me in that instance was my time capability you know, how do I do this with um, kids? I was a new mom myself and just navigating that space. I had my kids really close together. And so I was almost really frustrated with myself. I was used to being 100% focused and not having this distraction, for lack of a better term, on the side. And so we really had to navigate what, you know, what are, what is going to be my role in this business, knowing that I can't put in the time uh, that is necessary to build this. And fortunately, Stephen was able to step up and say, oh, you know what, I will, I will maybe take on a little bit more uh, so that this, you know, you can deal with what you have uh, as a family. But that, that is a tricky conversation. And I have had multiple uh, conversations with founders who have said that the life stage affects. So you have someone who's Maybe, you know, again, doesn't have a family um, and the other one does, or one person is retired and they're able to put all of this uh, emphasis into something and the other person is uh, not, or they're constrained by finances. And so these are these issues that can come in that often come with the life stage. That those are those pieces that can affect, again, the partnership, time commitment, financial commitment. How quickly does someone actually need a salary? Sometimes one's like, I'm good. I've got a little kitty aside that I can work off of. And the other person's like, nah, I, I am, I got to get paid today. And now you got to work out how do you distribute profits? How do we handle um, uh, dividends? Do we, do we reward the person who isn't requiring a salary with more equity in the business? These kind of questions then start to get complicated. 
I can imagine. You also said something just now that really fascinates me when you said you would get frustrated with yourself. And I am guessing from personal experience that that frustration bleeds into just about everything you're trying to do unless Mm -hmm. you catch yourself at it. Yeah. And of course, you know, like anything, entrepreneurship is one of the most, gosh, it's one of the most difficult, but it's also the most exhilarating things one can do. And so you really have to be checking yourself throughout that whole operation as well and making sure that you're looking at things optimistically, you're looking at things analytically, and you're giving yourself grace understanding you're never going to do it perfect. It it took my fourth company to decide that the best quote for an entrepreneur is enjoy the journey because you are trading your life for this experience. And if you don't find ways to enjoy it and let it, some of these struggles roll off your back and be like, it's okay. You know, we will move on and don't get worked up got to enjoy that journey and find ways on a day-to-day to to enjoy it. And that's what your co-founder is there for. Have fun with them. You know, make make that time in that office interesting. Have have stuff between you that you joke about, that you – little competition or little milestones that, hey, if we get this client – Let's go, um, let's go do a, a great dinner over at some cool steakhouse. Or I, I had two co-founders that when they built, uh, th- their goal was that if we build this one thing, we're going to go out and we're going to buy Rolexes for, for ourselves. And we'll have, that'll symbolize this one achievement that we did. And they made it fun. And I think that's such an important piece to it. Because if you're having fun, it's hard to, I don't know, just be, be discouraged and to find that your time is being zapped out of you. So make it fun. I love that, Rolex. <laughs> the reason I, I was kind of chuckling, I'm a solopreneur. I don't have a co-founder, but I'm seriously considering after meeting you, finding one. But I will, as a solopreneur, I will reward myself. I am a committed card-carrying introvert, but you ought to see my closet. It oh, I love it. It comes through up in there. It seriously does. <laughs> Well, you've got to be a perk for the hard work, right? It's got to be a perk for the hard work. I do. When something happens that I have worked hard at and I landed it, I'm like, (gasps) and I head off and I buy the biggest, baddest handbag I can find. I love (laughs) that. Good for you. I'm telling you, Nordstrom's, it's terrible. (laughs) And I may be, I kid you not, I may be in sweats like I am right now because it's cold. It was hot yesterday. It's cold today. But I've got stilettos that go with the sweat. I love <laughs> so, it. I love it. Why not? Well deserved. Well deserved. Well, that's what every time, and I, I'll swap my bags out all the time because now I have way too many of them. And, they, you know, I'm going to swap it out. I'm going to hang it on the hook in my foyer, and I can see it every time I go in there. Oh, good job. Good, good, good girl. I'm not so going anywhere, but I got that right? bag. <laughs> <laughs> it's a trophy. But, you know, before I let you go, and we've only got, oh, geez, about seven more minutes, I really wanted to ask you to, to talk to us about the private school that you founded, Live, Learn, Launch Academy. Yeah, so this was, um, this kind of started when I was building uh, my early companies. And as I mentioned before, both Stephen and I really just have high school diplomas. And we started our first business just about a year or so outside of high school. And oftentimes as we were building our businesses, we used to say, gosh, why don't they teach us this in school? (laughs) Like, why didn't we learn some of this stuff in school? And so when uh, at that time, I said, you know, if I ever have kids, I want them to learn practical education, things that are really going to help them in their day. So when my kids were born, when they were in about grade two or three, I pulled them out of school and I I decided that I was going to teach them entrepreneurship, financial literacy, and life skills. Things like how do you sew a button on or how do you network? How do you have a conversation with people? And these were the the core concepts that I did. And and what happened was after about a year or two, a few other families reached out to me and said, what are you doing? Especially during COVID, they thought their kids were actually learning and were like, ugh. So uh, they said, what are you doing? And so we created this small school called Little Learn Launch Academy, and it teaches that. So we have right now just eight students. And we're looking at potentially building and growing it um, for other teachers to provide to other kids. But the idea is um, a curriculum we call the PERT curriculum, which is practical experience.
experiential, relevant, and tailored. And everything that we teach needs to fall under that uh, sort of umbrella. So it has to be something these kids will use. So when your kid says, when am I ever going to use this, mom? <laughs> you can actually say, if you're being taught it, you're going to use it. <laughs> so that's Unless it's algebra. But, Nobody well, uses Well, it, we don't so. even teach algebra. That's the thing. We're a very yeah. alternative school in that respect. We are like, you're not going to ever learn that. So we're not teaching it. But these are the things that, uh, that we kind of went through with the school. And, um, yeah, we're excited about it. We're not sure where it's going to go, but um, – but right now, it's, it really is about teaching kids the, the, the important concepts that they need to use in everyday life. See, I absolutely love that. And I'll be very frank with you and our audience. I have a very poor attitude, I guess, about the public school system. Mm-hmm. Very poor. I think it's failing. I think it's failing deliberately. And mm-hmm. I'm not going to go down that road. But if mm-hmm. I had children, school age children... They would not be handed to the government to be educated about anything or, in my view, not educated. They're just not. So I love what you're doing with that. How would people find that? I mean, is it something you're sharing or you're inviting people into? We're not right now, but we do, I mean, people can follow us on Instagram. We do have a small little Instagram page and, and we are just talking about it right now. How do we, we are, our our teacher, we have a teacher that teaches all the kids. He's in the midst of making some courses and some classes that people can do uh, with their own uh, children or teachers can use within their classroom. But like I said, we're still not sure what we're going to do with it, but it is out there at live, learn, launch, or live, learn, launch on Instagram. And I suppose people could definitely say, hey, you know, if you ever do anything with this, let me know. Um, because we are looking at that right now. So many people are asking I hope about you it. <laughs> I hope you do because it's so important. I mean, listen, I see kids who, and I was mentioning this to on a, a recent podcast, that I watched these three young teenagers get off the bus in front of my house, and all three of them, I, I actually, I think I wept a little. Mm. These three kids get off the bus. Their shoulders are hunched over like they have a dower, dowager's hump coming up, and they're glued to their their screens. They're not speaking to one another. They're not happy. They're not bouncing off the bus. They kind of trudge their way down the street, and all I could think was, oh, this cannot go well for you if you don't pull your head off of that screen and talk with one another yeah. and learn yeah. things, watch the birds, do something, put the yeah. phone down. That's it. That's so our key focus in the school is to be able to recognize opportunity and learn how to, to take it. And so that's the most important thing. Education in the world around us is changing so quickly. The world that our kids are in now is not going to be that same world even five years from now. So I think the most important thing we can teach our kids is how do you recognize opportunity and take a, take a hold of it and, and endeavor into it. And oftentimes it isn't a skill set that does it, but it's an internal requirement where a belief in yourself and a willingness to try and to, to get past fear. And that is something you teach as you give pe- the kids different projects to, to, to experiment with and you don't confine them to we're going to tell you what to do and you just listen to what I say and follow. You give them that free reign to try things and have a voice and that's where kids and, and adults even are going to take opportunity is they see it and they're not afraid to give it a go. And so that to me is such an important factor uh, to teaching kids and I don't think the school system really allows that. It's very easy to get a eh, you're wrong um, and that stops people from trying. It does. And I'm so glad we brought this up. And I'm so glad you're doing this. And listen, when I was in school, everybody was taught the same thing. We were all at different levels. Yeah. And to this day, I fight with my NAS system. She's not the boss of me. Don't tell me what to do. Yeah. It, <laughs> it's true. It messed with my head, I'm telling you. But well, I don't I was mind a, it. I like to quarrel about things. Exactly. And I, I mean, I was a C minus student. I, I, I mean, I, I, from all intents and purposes in school, I didn't look like anybody who would achieve anything. I and mean, I was there to socialize and was there to have fun. So, um, you know, again, academics isn't necessarily a sign of whether or not someone will succeed. It's about, you know, their, their opinion and their ability of, of what, what they can achieve. 
And I think that's what we got to build. We can't have kids hunched over and disconnected from the world. They need to really believe in themselves and be excited about the opportunity that lays ahead of them. Kids and adults. Listen, Mm. before I let you go, Tannis, is there anything else you really want the audience to know? And I would also love for you to share how people can find you. Yeah. So I I just want to reiterate again that your business partnership is your greatest asset or your biggest liability in your business. And so you really need to be intentional if you're in a partnership. So without sounding silly, um, the co-founders handbook is an incredible resource. I have taken everything from hundreds of co-founders, all their cautions, all their advice, and I've wrapped it up in there. So whether you're deciding whether you should get a co-founder or whether you're in a partnership now, that book will guide you through so much things. So the Co-Founders Handbook is available in audio, ebook, paperback, hardback on every platform out there. Head out there and get it. Um, and then check out the Co-Founders Hub. Put your name out there and we will let you know as soon as these products are available and we will help you. So the cofoundershub.com and the Co-Founders Handbook and we're on all social media platforms, specifically LinkedIn. You can follow me directly at Tannis George. Um, and if you have any questions, by all means, reach out to me. Send me a question. Uh, I might use it in my social media content, but that's great because that will go and help. Because believe me, whatever question you ask, hundreds of co-founders are asking it at the same time. So send any questions my way on LinkedIn or Instagram. Um, I'm available in all those spots. Terrific. I'm waiting for your book to hit my um, my doorstep. It should be here it's today. Um, yeah. Oh, good. I can't wait. And I'm so glad you mentioned Audible because I have three credits. All oh, right. Perfect. Yes, Audible. I'm going to get you it that. today. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Well, Tess, thank you so much. Before we wrap up today's episode, if you have enjoyed today's episode and found our insights, her insights, helpful. Me, I was just in the way asking silly questions. Please leave us a review and a rating on iTunes. Your feedback helps us improve and reach that you know, more people to help them on their success success journeys. <laughs> oh boy. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button, leave a review, and share your partner in Success Radio with your friends and colleagues. And look for Tannis George. It's J-O-R-G-E, but it's pronounced George. Look for her online and go follow her because she's brilliant. Thank you for tuning in, and we will catch you on the next one. Tennis, thank you so much. Thanks, Denise. It was super fun. Get your voice heard. If you would like to launch your own far-reaching podcast, contact Denise Griffiths at yourofficeontheweb.com and go to the podcast tab. 